Good morning, good evening, and good afternoon. Welcome all to the Association of Jewish Libraries Research, Archives, and Special Collections presents the pains, pitfalls, and pleasures of Geniza Provenance Research. Thank you all for coming. We truly appreciate it. Let me introduce you today to Dr. Rebecca Jefferson. Rebecca is the curator of the Israel and Ray Price Library of Judaica at the University of Florida and a joint faculty member at the, at the Center for Jewish Studies. Rebecca received her PhD in Medieval Hebrew from the University of Cambridge and worked as a bibliographer at the Taylor Schechter Geniza Research Unit prior to moving to the United States. She published numerous articles on the history and provenance of the Cairo Geniza collections and her book, her most recent publication, The Cairo Geniza and the Age of Discovery in Egypt was recently published in February of 2022. It's a beautiful book, I really recommend it. We, all, we will have approximately 45 minutes of presentation time and about 15 minutes for Q&A at the end. Please feel free to write your questions in the chat. Lastly, uh, please observe proper decorum during this presentation. I now turn over the mic to Dr. Rebecca Jefferson. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. I'm just going to, can you all see my screen? Yep. Yep. Oh, no, I, I see you, not your, not the opinion. No, you're not shared yet. I'm um, not shared yet. Oh. Yeah, just reshare. Oh, okay, sorry. Reshare. Okay, can you see it now? Wonderful. Okay. Well, thank you very, very much to Haim and to Michelle and to Amalia and to all the organizers of the wonderful AJL Presents. I'm so proud and honored to be invited to talk for this uh, wonderful forum. So today I'm going to uh, talk to you about some of the methods and challenging of, of tracing Geniza provenance, uh, some of the pitfalls and roadblocks caused by missing or conflicting evidence, and as well, some of not, uh, not least, the pleasures of discovering lost or underexplored connections as part of this research. Okay. Oh, now it's not moving on. There we go. Right. Okay. So provenance research. So just to quickly outline what that means. It's the history of an object, uh, where and why and how it was found, who, who created it, uh, together with the history of the chain of its ownership. Um, so this type of research was traditionally associated with the authentic authentication of artworks, but today it's broadly applied to other fields um, and encompasses expansive object biographies and ownership histories for a range of cultural artifacts, including books and manuscripts. And we know this well from um, uh, uh, Michelle and Columbia University's wonderful Footprints project. Um, so books are certainly included now in this whole provenance research field. And here I, I just showed you an image from one of uh, David Kaufman's uh, manuscripts in which we can actually see uh, uh, some provenance recorded on the manuscript, um, uh, although we might want to question his method of scrawling all over his manuscripts with purple pen. Um, Anyway, with regard to uh, tracing Geniza provenance and provenience, and by provenience we mean it's an archaeological term to mean the fine spot, um, we uh, really have to bear in mind one very, very essential point about the Cairo Geniza, and that is that the fact that the Ben Ezra synagogue was dismantled in 1889 and rebuilt, and therefore we actually have no idea of what was stored there prior to 1889. All that we know is what Sol Solomon Schechter found, mostly because it wasn't all found there uh, when he encountered it in 18, 1897, which was a new building. So um, in 1887, 18, 18, uh, Elkin Nathan Adler uh, uh, wrote an article about the, uh, his uh, Geniza material in the Jewish Quarterly Review. And I've created this image to try and show you how Adler was presenting the discovery of the Geniza. And it starts with the little bubbles um, at the top right there and how uh, the, some of the fragments were coming out of the libraries. Um, he says, uh, for instance, Agnes Lewis and Margaret Gibson had some important ones. David Kalman especially had some important ones. Um, and then he gets around finally to Solomon Schechter, who he declares is exhaustively ransacked the Geniza. And so that's how <laughs> it's, presented in 1897. Well, with my research, um, I'm afraid the picture looks a little bit more complicated than that. And here you can see a visual of, I've created of all the, the collections, the collectors and the dealers and the possible find spots that were occurring just in 1897. I really, when I got into 
doing this, I wanted to create a whole map of the situation, but it's far too big to draw and far too complicated. So anyway, this gives you a, a little idea of what was going on. Um, here is a, a visual to show you some of the collectors and dealers involved in finding Geniza fragments. Again, this is not the full picture. I can't fit them onto one screen, nor can I find images of every person involved. Um, and when we look at the individual collections, we also have to break those down into uh, different provenances, um, because here is a depiction of the, the Cambridge collection. And as you can see, uh, it breaks down into sub collections and those sub collections have their own provenience and provenance, some of them unknown, um, and some of them not always coming from, um, I can see I've colored it, some of them not always from Egypt, some of them coming through Palestine. Uh, so the picture is very complex, and thus the tracing of provenance is complex. And today, as it stands, here is a depiction of the major Geniza collections, but in fact, there are many more than these, uh, much smaller ones, uh, possibly about 60 overall in, in institutions and many private collections too, but these are the major ones. And so you can see the problem, the, the challenge of doing provenance research on all these collections with all their sub-collections and all of the archives that are associated with them, they're spread around the world. Some archives are spread across locations, others are in inaccessible, missing or lost. But provenance research usually starts with the object itself. And so we use colophons in the manuscripts and we use, um, if we, if we, certainly with regard to documentary manuscripts, we look at all the information in the manuscript to tell us about how it was created, who created it and when. And so here we can see an example of a manuscript that was given to the Bodleian libraries by Solomon Aaron Wertheimer in 1892. And it tells us specifically that it was written um, uh, in a town uh, uh, near the Nile. The objects can also have marks or labels that tell us something about the chain of ownership. The thing is, this is not usual for Geniza fragments, and so to find one with this on uh, is, 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 is rare. But here we have one uh, in the Bodleian Library that has this uh, notation on it that it's bought for B.P. Grenfell in uh, 18, bought from rather B.P. Grenfell in 1899. And this was Bernard Pine Grenfell. And he was an Egyptologist, and he was very involved in the discovery of the Oxyrhynchus papyri. And so when we look into how he possibly got hold of this fragment, we might also want to look um, at what his involvement in, in discovering papyri was and how the two might be interlinked. Where no provenance exists, we can look at content and materiality, language, script, all the other clues that are in the manuscript to help us trace provenance. In the case of this one, um, it's, a, uh, it's a curious thing to have in a, a Geniza, a Jewish Geniza from Cairo. It's actually a Latin uh, copy of the Iliad, um, and it doesn't seem to really fit the context. And in fact, if you do a little bit of digging in the archives, you'll find that the manuscript itself uh, was came out of um, a collection of manuscripts that was stored for some time in the librarian's room at Cambridge University Library. So one might even speculate <laughs> that this was not even part of the Cairo Geniza, but was part of some other archive that the library was dealing with. And so it's very important to look at the additional documentation surrounding uh, manuscripts, look at the accession, conservation, processing, cataloging, digitization records where they're available because some of this key data is often overlooked when it comes to compiling the official catalog. Um, uh, provenance can also be traced by going that extra step, step of looking, tr trying to trace all the people involved with um, the sale and purchase of fragments. And so you can look at the pa personal papers of the individuals involved. Um, however, some of these papers might not be where you expect to find them. And in the case of the one that I'm showing you here, this is a, a letter from uh, the Assyriologist, Oxford Assyriologist um, Archibald Henry Sace. Uh, and he's writing about the activities of a figure called the Count Dulst in Cairo, who's conducting excavations on behalf of Oxford. And it's a really uh, great letter. It tells us a lot about what Oxford was doing to get Geniza fragments. Um, but when I went looking for 
um, and I knew that Archibald Henry Sace was a major figure in the Oxford collections because he's credited in the catalogue. The Count Dulst isn't credited, but uh, Sace is. So my very first step was to go to Oxford and look at Sace's own archive of personal papers. And in fact, I only had a few days there and I, I was so frustrated that I spent many, many hours looking through his papers only to discover one letter of relevance. And in fact, the relevant letters were in quite a different ar archive and this is the one pertaining to the purchases of manuscripts from the Count Dulce. So you have to really expect to find um, clues in many unusual places. And I would say leave no stone unturned. There are all sorts of unusual places that you can find provenance information. This is a wonderful um, um, visitor book uh, belonging to a major antiquarian in Egypt called Maurice Nachman and all the many collectors from around the world signed his book and I you think you can see there on the right that Cyrus Adler one of the Geniza collectors has been and visited Maurice Nachman in Egypt. Um, Sometimes the Geniza fragments came with documentation. Uh, it's also fairly rare, but um, in this case, uh, with another Bodleian fragment, we have a letter from um, Francis Llewellyn Griffith, uh, another Egyptologist who was passing along this fragment on behalf of uh, G.W. Murray, who was working on a survey in Egypt. And we don't know how or why he came across these fragments, but we could just, again, we have this clue that they were found in the Fayum. And again, we can uh, start to think about um, how we can connect up all these different find spots and what it says about the original find spot of such pieces. Now that piece was the piece that's um, uh, on the uh, right and the piece that's on the left is matching piece that both came from the same book uh, was was given to the Oxford uh, in 1891 by uh, a person called Greville John Chester. Now we can we might be able to look at this and say our oh, here are pieces of the same book they both came from the Ben Ezra synagogue obviously they both got it got torn up, a piece went out into the antiquities market and came through Greville Chester and a piece went out into the antiquities market and came through Murray. On the other hand, we could also, we don't know how Chester got his pieces from 1891, his method of acquiring Geniza fragments becomes very obscure. And so we don't know precisely what the provenience of these two pieces might have been. Um, so again, it's, I would say that uh, trying to gather all of this information, you're going to have to look through a vast array of key resources. And these are just some of the places that I've been digging over the years. Uh, and you can see from the image on the right that, uh, there's, that you can find important biographical information in all sorts of places. This is a journal called Biblia. And here we have a little obituary to Greville Chester. Uh, and it just discusses how um, uh, uh, dealers from all over would trusted him so much they would bring him all their wares to Cairo. And so this gives us a little bit of insight into the way Chester went about collecting his fragments. So that's very all very good, well and good, and I've given you the how-tos and all the rest of it. And um, it's really, though, a case of do as I say, don't do as I do, <laughs> because I really started off in free flow. Uh, and I love this quotation from uh, Stolberg and Lehman about uh, the way of doing provenance research and how you have to be systematic and method and method methodical, but it also involves a lot of free flow and hunches and epiphanies. And really, that's the way I started out. And uh, my, my intro into this was, was really quite accidental. I discovered um, this uh, figure, this Count Dulst. I found him in an article uh, in the Jewish Chronicle. And then I, I started uh, digging from there and going to the archives of relevance and finding pieces and really just putting pieces uh, together and slowly building that picture. Um, but now let me tell you about the pitfalls of some of this, appro this approach <laughs> and that's uh, and, and, and any provenance research. And one of the pitfalls is really uh, the dangers of over-reliance on one single source um, or any really any of the sources. You've got to really uh, cross-check them and double-check them. 
in, in my case, what I did is, is I was so excited about this discovery of, of Count uh, Dulst, who was collecting for the Bodleian, and I found his archive. I found the, the archivist helped me find uh, his archive in the Bodleian, uh, full of letters, really fascinating letters showing his complete history uh, with the Bodleian from 1889 uh, through right to the 1930s. Uh, an incredible archive, and I wrote my first article from it called A Geniza Secret. And in, 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 at one point, I claimed that um, Greville Chester was never involved with the uh, Cairo Geniza fragments because the Count Dahl says so. He clearly says in this letter, I know that the Reverend Greville Chester, I knew him himself, and he never had any of the old Cairo manuscripts. And I took uh, Count Dulst at his word. Well, then along came uh, the wonderful Adina Hoffman and Peter Cole, and they started writing their book, and they did some digging in the archives, and through help with archivists, they found the Greville Chester archive, uh, which is another wonderful archive full of letters pertaining to uh, Chester's clandestine collecting and uh, uh, sending of fragments to the Bodleian in the early period between 1889 and 1892. Fantastic resource, and sheds a whole new light uh, on, on what was happening with the Bodleian collection and very important connections to the collection overall. Um, um, I just have to say that Chester is, is, is this rich resource, but he never names his dealers. So it's also a source um, that has a lot of holes in it as well. And so you have to use his source alongside others. Um, but what I did do with his, as I read it very, very carefully, and I was digging as deep as I possibly could to get at how he got his manuscripts. And one technique I would encourage others to use is to really examine that language and put it put things next to one another to see what patterns occur. And here you can see that he's really, he's receiving them. He's not going out and choosing them. He's not going out and sourcing them for various places. He's receiving them. They're coming to him. And so that perhaps gives us a clue as, and as we saw in that, um, that obituary that dealers would bring manuscripts to him. So it's a little bit of an insight. It's certainly not the whole story. So again, the learning of the importance of cross-checking and verifying sources is very important. Something I learned and I'm still learning along the way, there are many stumbling blocks and many mistakes that I still make. Um, I went back to the, the Count Dulst archive and now I was looking at it quite differently and starting to look at it as well with more suspicious eyes. Uh, Count Dulst is a mysterious figure. He has unfortunately been portrayed in scholarship as something of a uh, false fake figure. And so now I was looking at his archive with eyes of, well, where is the fakery? Where is he lying to me? And in some cases, there are things where it's, 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 it's very difficult to know what's happening. So for example, he quotes many uh, people who have written to him as proof of his involvement uh, in the Geniza find. Uh, and he quotes from those letters in 1914. And then his wife quotes from them again in 1932. And there are differences between the quotations. And I'm thinking to myself, well, if they're reading the same source letter, how are there differences in these quotations? Are they making them up? But finally, I got to some proof that they were genuine, and that's this is what you see here, and it's a draft letter to be signed by the university's vice chancellor congratulating the Count Dulce, and his wife copies it exactly in 1932. So we know she has this letter in her possession. So, but it's really important. I wanted to show you this because of the importance of checking and verifying your sources. And learning to question everything. I have done so much examining of Elkin Nathan Adler and his Geniza and his exploits, and he's a wonderful figure. And it's really only recently that I've come to question many things about his uh, encounter with the Geniza. And so when you start to look at his um, uh, 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 sort of a, 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 his, uh, the way he's presented his encounter with the Geniza, it really is underwhelming. Um, he talks about it in 1897, 1904, 1909, 1921, and he's, he loves talking to an audience. He gives many uh, speeches in London. Uh, he gives many interviews for the Jewish Chronicle. His article, The, he uh, the Humors of Hebrew Manuscripts, is a wonderful article. He just loves sharing about his manuscript finds. Why doesn't he say anything about the Geniza? He was the first person, supposedly, in the Cairo Geniza, in the Ben Ezra synagogue, this overwhelming vision of 
hundreds of thousands of manuscripts, you know, a uh, uh, Schechter's battlefield of books. Why doesn't Adler ever, ever describe his impressions of the Cairo Geniza? So was he really there is something I've been asking myself recently. Now we have to learn, think about the ethical implications of using all these personal papers in provenance research. Um, this slide was created this morning. <laughs> it's a fresh mea culpa. <laughs> and it comes, and I don't know if he's with us today, but it comes from Ben Althwaite, fresh this morning to my email, <laughs> to tell me that in my book, I had misquoted uh, 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 Solomon Aaron Wertheimer. And in my defense, it's a, it's a matter of the... Um, British and American period. Um, so I was quoting uh, the very bottom of the letter, you can see that uh, Wertheimer says that he's waiting to hear, uh, waiting to get a reply. And that's what I was quoting. Um, but I put the period after reply, making it seem that that was the end of the sentence when it's not the end of the sentence, the end of the sentence is, which will greatly oblige. And so this just tells us that when we're quoting and extracting from letters, we really have to be as accurate as possible because now you know you, you'll get a different impression of Wertheimer if you understand his his supreme politeness <laughs> in reply in writing to the to the library. Um, anyway, so that's just uh, a mea culpa. Um, many, many other pitfalls include the challenges of language and script in the sources, and oh, how I've struggled with David Kaufman. <laughs> not only his German script, not only his German language, but also his Hebrew language, which is impossible. Um, so I've, I've tended to overlook some of his letters, I'm afraid, and so I've got more work to do there. And then the image... Um, uh, on the right was a struggle as well, but not quite as much of a struggle. And that was the German uh, letter uh, written by um, uh, uh, Mordechai Ad Adelman to David, uh, to Solomon Schechter. Um, and that was a very revealing letter uh, uh, showing a relationship between a key supplier to David Kaufman also had an important relationship to Solomon Schechter. But there are many pitfalls and challenges <laughs> along the way. Um, other pitfalls include the ambiguous nature of some of the institutional records, uh, and this is at the Bibliothèque Nationale de France, and this is no criticism of them whatsoever. It's just that what they have here are a few Geniza fragments, and they have them, they came to them via this uh, character called William Charles Auguste Mayo, um, and so the record shows that well, it doesn't show it, doesn't specify it, but it, it lends the impression that the, these Geniza fragments belong to Mayor. And so I did a lot of digging about Mayor and trying to find, trace him back and see what, how he could have got the fragments. He visited Egypt in 1872, but it wasn't until I looked at some of the other letters in the collection and one of them that was wrapped around the manuscripts that I discovered who really probably got these fragments. And that was a, a gentleman called Paul Laufer who visited Egypt in 1893. Um, um, and um, he probably, and this uh, one of the fragments that he found actually connects to a Wertheimer fragment uh, from a similar period. So it's just one of the pitfalls is really kind of beyond some of the story. And pitfall is coming up again, evidence. So um, a lot of research that I've done into personal papers and institutional records is to try and uncover the history of this character here. His name is Reginald Q. Enrique. He was a Manchester businessman living in Cairo. Um, Schechter befriended him and he kind of became Schechter's scout in Cairo. Um, and after Schechter left, he did a lot of work on his behalf, trying to scoop up the fragments that had been excavated by the Count Dulst. Um, and we can see through uh, the letters that Enrique wrote to Cambridge um, that uh, he sent quite a lot of fragments on to Schechter. Um, and today, all we have in the institutional record is one uh, box of fragments uh, attributed to uh, and here on the, in the, you can see in the image on the right from the institutional record, it shows the notes that um, there were six sacks and three bags, but those sacks and three bags got uh, subsumed into the collection and there's no way of tracing them now. So the provenance research comes to a dead end, unfortunately. 
now some of the pleasures of provenance research. Um, it's been wonderful uh, making connections from silence and conflicting evidence. Um, I have to say this is a pleasure and I, or I should add it's also a pain because there's a little painful <laughs> side to this as well. So uh, for the book, I was started to do some investigations into um, um, the Wertheimer story connected to um, the Ben Sira manuscripts. Um, uh, the Wertheimer family um, always claimed that uh, Wertheimer was instrumental in, in discovering the first uh, leaf of Ben Sira. Um, and, and here you can see the image on the lower left uh, was, a, was a piece uh, written by Moses Wertheimer um, in uh, the 1940s um, talking about this story. But the way the story is told, Wertheimer's story is told through his family, it doesn't make any sense because we know that Schechter was the first person to light upon uh, Ben Sira. We have all the evidence from that. And we know that it came to him from Lewis and Gibson. Wertheimer claimed it came to him uh, that Wertheimer had the Ben Sira fragment. He gave it to Moses Gaster and Moses Gaster gave it to Schechter. And we know that that's not true. That doesn't make any sense. But then when I tried to think about it a little bit more and I was connecting up all these things, I thought, well, hold on a minute. How is it that, well, no, what I thought was, I focused on the language. Wertheimer said he had the first leaf of Ben Sira. But what if we really meant the first page of Ben Sira? That's a whole different thing. And when you go to uh, Schechter's uh, publication of Ben Sira, then you see that the very first page of Ben Sira is a manuscript known as MSA. And here you can see an image of one of the pages of MSA in the Schechter collection. Um, and then when you look at how Schechter presented MSA to the world, it's really quite interesting. There's a whole level of silence there. Schechter never shouts out to anybody, hey, look, I've got it. Look at MSA. We've got another version here. It's an important version. It's the first pages of Ben Sira. No, he only tells the world. Uh, when he publishes his Opus Magnum. And again, when you read through the, 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 the wisdom of Ben Sira, you don't see any sort of fanfare for MSA. It's really just presented alongside the wonderful MSB, uh, the first discussion. Rebecca, you seem to have frozen. Hopefully we'll get back. her back. Am I back? Yeah, now you're back. Yeah, now you're so back. we missed yeah. the last minute or so. Oh, say so when you pull it, do you hear me saying, are you pull at all these sources and then you can find oh, no, these. We so ended at MSB. MSB. Hmm. I think we lost. Yeah. Oh, we must have lost her completely. Yeah. Okay. Hopefully she'll be back in a minute. One second. Thank you for your patience. It Let's looks like Rebecca got knocked off. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Okay. Here she's she back. Is. Okay. Rebecca? But you're muted, Rebecca. Great. Can you hear me? Okay. Now, yes. now I apologize. I don't know. I must have an unstable connection. I'm so, so sorry. Start, start, start back with MSB and, and Wartimer. Okay. So MSB still gets the major fanfare in Schachter's book because MSB was the one that he discovered uh, through uh, Lewis and Gibson. And MSA has this aura of silence around it. And I think this can help us build um, and support Wertheimer's story. Nevertheless, the reason I said there's some pain involved in this is um, in making all these connections and trying to uh, build this this story out, I realize that I'm only getting part of the story. You're only ever getting part of the story, and so I really don't want to um, uh, do anything wrong by Solomon Schachter. I love Solomon Schachter; he's a great, great scholar, great character, and so I, I do want to be really careful when I present these things. So again, that's part of the ethical considerations of all this provenance research. Um, oh, now is it? It's frozen. All right, Ooh. where am I? Now I'm jumping all over the place. Okay, all right. So another pleasure is discovering key relationships that perhaps haven't been uh, explored previously. Um, 
And one of the things that used to bug me for many years uh, was Agnes Lewis's claim in, in a, an article she wrote in 1907 that a certain Dr. Lansing was one of the first, was the first rather person to bring Geniza fragments to Europe. And I remember discussing this with other Geniza scholars and we would say, how the heck could that be? Who is this Lansing? Why does she credit him this way? No one's ever spoken about him before. Uh, and many years ago when I was digging, I couldn't find anything other than Lansing was um, a clergyman uh, in Cairo um, and sort of heavily involved with the Coptic community. And that's really the extent of what I could find. Um, but uh, really recent times, the digital age is such a boon to uh, Geniza provenance research, it really, really is. And so many periodicals are now coming online. And so I'm able to uh, extend those searches. And finally, I discovered that Lansing's son, John Julian Lansing, was a professor at the Sage Library in New Brunswick, uh, and that he was given uh, funds, funding to go uh, in 1888 to Cairo uh, and bring back manuscripts for the Sage Library. And Lansing was very involved in uh, uh, with the Karite community, and he brings back um, a Torah scroll and other fragments. And he even has a, 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 a communication with Adolf Neubauer in Oxford over certain of these Karite manuscripts. Um, and then the, the figure that you're seeing there, that's um, that's one of Lewis, uh, Agnes Lewis's uh, lantern slides. And actually in the archive, when you go to it, it's, an, it's, it's described as an unnamed man. Um, but comparing his photos to other photos, I can see that this is uh, Andrew Watson. And he was head of the American uh, Presbyterian mission in Cairo. And Lewis and Gibson were very connected to the mission in Cairo. They were Presbyterians too. Uh, they would stay at the mission. The mission was very instrumental in helping them with uh, their their journeys to Sinai. Um, and so, uh, and, and, and Andrew Watson is a figure that Schechter meets as well. And she, uh, he helps Schechter while he's in Cairo. So try, uh, finally being able to connect all these figures helps me understand that when you're building out the Geniza story, um, there are only really two degrees of separation between any of these characters. Um, um, pains, the pains of Geniza <laughs> uh, provenance research, many, many unresolved mysteries. I don't know if we'll ever resolve them. Um, here at the bottom left, you'll see there's a, there's a, uh, a letter from Archibald Henry Sace to Adolf Neubauer in Oxford. He writes it in March 19, 1895. And he, he's excited to tell him that at last his Cairo friend, the Count Dost, has succeeded uh, in discovering and entering the old subterranean place from which the Hebrew manuscripts have all come. This is such a <laughs> sort of a major thing uh, for us because it tells us that at least some of the manuscripts, and according to Sace, all of them, were stored in an underground space. It kind of makes sense when you think that the Ben Ezra synagogue was being uh, rebuilt from the ground up between 1889 and 1892, that they had to have somewhere to put the manuscripts that had been discovered in the building when it came down in 1889. And where better than to either bury them or to put them in some sort of temporary underground uh, storage space. And so I, in the book, I sort of uh, speculate on the various places this could be. When the building was rebuilt in 1892, there was a new basement put in the building, and that included many passageways, which could be a place to store manuscripts. There was an old cistern uh, in the grounds of the building, which probably was uh, disused from at least 1883, when there was a huge cholera outbreak and all the cisterns in the town were closed off. Um, so that could be another place. Um, it also, the, the idea of a subterranean place also would account for so much damp that was discovered on many of the manuscripts. Um, the Geniza chamber itself within the, uh, within the uh, synagogue would have been a kind of a protected space where damp would not necessarily have leaked in. And in fact, had damp leaked in over the centuries, um, the, um, the parchment manuscripts would have all uh, perished. So we know that the damp is a later uh, thing. And there you see on the um, right an image of a cave in the Bassatine Cemetery, the ancient Bassatine, ancient Bassatine Cemetery uh, from um, the 8th century, um, is, was known as a storage place for Geniza fragments, uh, was a place where Schechter acquired Geniza fragments, 
and other collectors after Schechter and actually even recently. So that's another possible location of the subterranean, uh, uh, the subterranean place. But here is a pleasure. Uh, and that's kind of realizing, again, key, key language in some of these uh, uh, sources that uh, when I first read them didn't really occur to me. And so another part of this research is the, is the going over and over and over of the sources. And that also that free flow, that walking away from the sources and letting your mind just percolate on them. And then coming back. And when I read this uh, letter that you see on the right from Seis to Neubauer, now he's writing it um, many months later in November. So in March, he announces that they've discovered the subterranean place. And in November, he announces that the manuscripts, they have the manuscripts. And my first focus was on the fact that they have the manuscripts, how much they were paying for them, who they were negotiating with, um, how many they'd found because they described the box that the count is going to use. What I didn't focus on was that key opening sentence. At last, the manuscripts are coming in. They're coming in. They're coming in from somewhere. And so, you know, that supports the fact that they're outside. They're in a subterranean place and they're coming in. It also supports this, this fantastic idea that what Solomon Schechter actually discovered uh, in 1897 was not there for the longest time at all, but actually had only recently been put in there. Um, and I use this, I, did, I, 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 I hope you'll forgive me, Elia, Eliaza Horvitz. I hope you'll forgive me for using the image in his book. But it's such a wonderful image. Uh, he took this photograph in the 1990s in the Ben Ezra synagogue. He discovered these sacks in there. And I just wanted to give you that sense of sacks coming in from another place and being placed in the uh, Ben Ezra synagogue. Um, another pain and a pleasure. <laughs> The importance of staying connected and how information can emerge really when you least expect it. Uh, and I have to confess that prior to writing the book, when I first got my contract, I realized I was spending far too much time on Facebook and Twitter. <laughs> and then I was getting caught up in all the wonderful postings and, and really not getting taken away from Geniza research. And so I did this very dramatic thing where I, 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 got rid of my accounts. <laughs> and so apologies to anyone who was connected to me at that time. I just got rid of my accounts. It was this crazy, impulsive thing. Um, yet, you know, once I got started on the book and I was and I connected with various scholars, including um, Idan Dershowitz, a wonderful scholar who gave me this important connection to the Moses Shapira uh, manuscripts, I realized the importance of staying connected. And now I'm back on Facebook and Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you just, just don't know when somebody's working on something that can have relevance to your provenance research. And so this is a fantastic uh, uh, page from a handwritten catalog by Moses Shapira that's, uh, that's stored in the uh, Berlin uh, National Library and really gives us fantastic insights into Moses Shapira's forays into Gnizot uh, and what he obtained from them. Finally, this is another mea culpa. <laughs> oh, so much to still be done. The story is so vast. The work of the book continues. This is a letter that I put aside and never really got to. Um, it's a letter from uh, the chief rabbi of Cairo, uh, Raphael ben Shimon, to Solomon Schechter. He writes it in 1898. Um, Raphael Ben Shimon's Hebrew is so hard for me. <laughs> it's this 19th century Hebrew, uh, and it's kind of mixed in with other things, probably the fact that he's, his spoken language is Arabic. Um, it's very sort of flowery. Um, so I read one of his letters. So there are two letters in the Solomon Sheikh that archived by him. And one of the letters is uh, to um, Herman Adler, and I read it very, as carefully as I possibly could, and it shed a lot of light on the relationship between Adler and Schechter, uh, and so I use that quite heavily in the book. This one, I kind of, I struggled with it, so I skim read it, and I, I got out of it the pieces that I needed, which was the fact that Schechter was continuing to supply the rabbi with books. And this is very important when you come to understand the relationship between Ben Shimon and Schechter and how Schechter really sort of um, kind of manipulated the relationship through uh, Ben Shimon's love of the printed work. Um, but there was something else hidden in this letter, something so key that I wish I'd had and I wish it went into the book. And uh, it's uh, Ben Shimon's uh, uh, confiding in Schechter how he's um, 
these two sacks of fragments uh, that the Shamash uh, Behor, this is the Shamash that bothered Shechta so much while he was there. Uh, he called him this terrible, terrible, uh, uh, wicked Behor. Um, but Behor is set aside for him these two special sacks of manuscripts. Uh, and But the problem is, um, uh, Ben Shimon explains that the, the um, guardianship of the synagogue has changed hands and there's a new goodbye in place. Um, and they're going to appoint a new honest and loyal Shemash, <laughs> not this terrible Behor. Anyway, so he's saying to him, he'll get these sacks to him, uh, but you're going to have to wait because there are all these researchers, visitors and uh, diggers on the scene. And this is the, this is the winter season when everyone's around trying to find Geniza fragments and so if you can just wait and hang on we will make sure to get these special sacks to you and so that again this tells us so much about Shechter's collection and 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 the parts of it that came to him after he got back from Cairo um, and I've I want to do so much more digging around this letter but anyway just shows you how um uh, the, the story continues and, and that, that's a great thing uh, and there's more work there's more there's work enough for more than one person that's for sure um, so that's it that's my uh, uh, presentation I hope I've kept uh, time kind of <laughs> all right thank you Rebecca this was a wonderful wonderful presentation Thank, Thank you. you so much. Now, so we, we are waiting for your sequel to come out soon. <laughs> <laughs> um, we actually uh, we, we have, I think, two questions in the chat, but I'm going to start with uh, William Fines. He had his hand up first. Okay. And then we'll move from there. So, William, you're Great. on. The, you're on. Let's see if he's still here. Maybe he stepped away. Let's. That's okay. Yeah. I think. Oh, now I'm unmuted. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I wondered about two things. Okay. What What do you mean by provenance? Does it mean who wrote the manuscript, as well as who owned it along the way? Yes, absolutely. And, second, and secondly, uh, my question is: uh, I understand all fragments have been digitized, and I wondered how that has affected your research. Right, thank you. Two great questions. And I'm sorry, it was a rather hurried uh, uh, presentation through and, 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 and really it's good to have, uh, I, I did that introductory slide into provenance research, but it, 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 it does require more explanation. And so provenance really talks about um, uh, sort of that, that, that chain of ownership. It, it talks about the, the object itself and, and where it was created, who created it, how it was created, it, the, the situation surrounding its creation, but then also the sort of the chain of possession and ownership and how it comes to where it is in present day, how it gets there. And we're, so with Geniza provenance, it's, it's very complex because you've got, uh, you not only got, you're not only trying to ch trace that ownership tra chain, you're, you're also trying to chain, trace what we call is the provenience, and that is the fine spot where it was found, because the fine spot is not absolutely the Ben Ezra synagogue. It's Ben Ezra synagogue is one of the fine spots. Um, and the other question was, oh, uh, the digitization, marvelous, a wonderful, a wonderful boon to provenance research, absolutely. Um, it can be a little bit misleading at times. I mean, the digital object uh, is, is not a good, uh, you really sometimes have to go to the physical object because there are clues in the physical object that you you can't always get from the from the digital. Um, but certainly, it's it's made many steps uh, in the in the provenance research. It's taken away many steps that would stop a person from um, uh, being able to do as much as they'd like to do because these these collections are spread around the world and so to be able to visit all of these places around the world and spend the time examining the fragments and the archives would take years and years and years it would be impossible so yes digitization is a wonderful tool thank you Rebecca, we have a question from uh cheryl shellstall and okay, she says hi, it is cheryl. in the chat she says uh, she didn't know that the synagogue, like the, I guess it was Ben Ezra, it was rebuilt. Is the assumption that some or most of the original Geniza was transferred over to the new building? I guess this is something you already addressed, but maybe if you want to bring well, it up. Well, yeah, and it's, and, and it's a great question, and I don't know that a 
I, I can supply full answer. But what I try to do in the book is try to supply some answers. Um, yes, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's been a known fact. It's something that other scholars have discovered before me, the fact that the, uh, the Ben Ezra synagogue was rebuilt. Um, and you can find a lot of the information about that in the wonderful book by, edited by Phyllis Lambert, The Fortifications of the Synagogue, where the uh, archeologist who went to restore the modern building um, did investigations into the structures of the older buildings. Um, and so, uh, but but yes, I mean, but but what I found is that when when people talk about the Cairo Geniza, they tend to it's something they tend to brush over very quickly or not even address. And it's really a key point: the fact that the building came down on what was there before wasn't necessarily what was there after uh, is something that we really need to think about. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, we have a question from Michelle. Um, so I really, I really enjoyed your book, first of all, um, oh, and second of all, as, as spe I especially appreciated the, um, the appendix at the end of Geniza collections, um, and noting Cheryl's comment about HECLA having one fragment, are you still interested in collecting information about Geniza fragments in various collections? Are you going to maintain that? And is there a way that you know are you thinking about a website are you thinking about um a place where you can post updates now that that i feel like once you <laughs> say i'm gathering this data others might share that and then right. is there another way that's more flexible than a publication right. to put that out that's a fantastic question and awesome idea so i have to credit the idea of the appendix to one of my reviewers of my manuscript uh and i was so grateful for it i it, it did take it was a painful process compiling it uh, at the last minute but um, I, I, it was such a great idea and you were right and I'd love to put it somewhere and build upon it and I'd love to find out from other people more about their collections and more about collections that I don't know my I think the only stumbling block block will be with the fact that I've published this uh, appendix and there's kind of limitations on what could be shared open access now. <sighs> so we'll see, <laughs> it might be something to negotiate with the publishers um, and, or, or, or find a, 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 perhaps another alternative way of sharing this information, uh, creating some sort of database out of it. Yeah, Great. thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Rebecca. And we have two questions. Uh, we'll start with uh, Hansen Svernt and then uh, Rachel. Rachel. Oh, thank you so, so much. This was wonderful, really wonderful. I have a question um, regarding, maybe I start this way. Yes. I, Cecil Ross had also some, has some fragments in his collection, which he describes as Geniza. And they were recorded as coming from the Cairo Geniza. And I have the feeling that he did this only to be, to have this, to have parts of this famed collection, but it can be any Geniza of the world. So, and I suspect, I would say, I don't know whether you stumbled about other cases, you know, where it is kind of ambiguous from where these fragments are, but it's just Geniza and when everybody, when they hear Geniza, they suddenly think, they automatically think of Cairo. So this, yeah. I imagine, can complicate your research a lot. It, it does indeed. You're absolutely right. And, and, and that has become the thing. The Cairo Geniza has become synonymous with the Ben Ezra synagogue. And the Cairo Geniza provenance label was widely applied to fragments that came out post Schechter. Um, and so anytime there was a fragment <laughs> on the market, oh, well, it's a Cairo Geniza fragment. Now, that's not to say that it, necess it, it wasn't necessarily part of the cash that was associated with the Ben Ezra synagogue and 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 uh, scholars uh, around the world are doing fantastic job of, of of joining fragments together and matching them up and finding you know um, so it, it, in some cases they do match and in some cases we can say that that's the provenience and the provenance but in other cases this label has just been applied um, in order to be <laughs> I see that Michelle wrote in order to be one of the coolest kids on the farm, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> yes, and so it does complicate things very much. Uh, and Roth has two collections. Um, I was recently uh, 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 
PhD student uh, got in touch with me. She's working as an intern in Leeds, uh, and she was very interested in his 1949 collection of fragments that seems to have come from North Africa, and she wanted some um, help in uh, uh, having a look at those. And so, yes, we unfortunately, the, uh, the antiquities trade has created this uh, kind of vast problem. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, we have a question from Racheli. The floor is yours. Hi, uh, Rebecca. Thank you so much for sharing so much of behind the scenes. I really <laughs> admire your work. Thank you. Uh, wonderful. Thank you. Uh, and uh, my question is in that same spirit, since you went into really uh, your uh, research methods in a way and uh, even gave advice which I will take <laughs> seriously. Um, I wonder, so this is a practical question. What kind of tools, digital tools, did you use to arrange all the vast, um, you know, materials? Huge pile of materials, letters, fragments, right. et cetera. You mean what digital tools did I use to, to, put, to, to create my own archive, as it were? Yes, your own database, how right. to annotate. How to yes. <laughs> oh, another <laughs> confession. No. Okay, so again, I was starting in free flow. <laughs> and I have, I have folders full of uh, pencil written notes because my first um, method was going to the archives, and this is still a great method, uh, and with pencil uh, transcribing all of the letters. So I have letters in pencil transcription. Um, but then <laughs> uh, the digital age uh, advanced my methods. And so um, I've been to the archives where I've taken uh, photographs. Um, I've also paid to have microfilm sent to me and digital scans from microfilm. And um, so before uh, I started um, writing the book, many, uh, a year or so before, I thought you really need to get your stuff in order. <laughs> and so I then started to be more systematic and created many folders. So I have folders uh, in, an, uh, in a file I call protagonists and each folder is the name of the protagonist. And within each folder, I have uh, scans of letters relating to that protagonist, uh, scans of periodicals that I've taken from online, um, uh, my own notes, uh, or lists, many, 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 many things. I also have a, a complementary file that I call institutions. Um, and so I keep, uh, and, and each institution that has Geniza fragments that I'm aware of um, has uh, material that's in those folders as well. So that's how I've kind of been doing it. Does that, does that, does that answer the question? Um, yes, although I'm, I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm disappointed, but <laughs> I was expecting to find a new tool. I, I just recently oh, no, I downloaded a, a tool called uh, Notability, so right. I can use Notability. Ah, okay. It's for the I iPad, and I can use the pencil to mark, oh. to, to annotate um, oh, good Lord. No, documents. Would... My research is also in the materiality of the book, right. but very different kind of books. Yes. But it's this was this is my current solution. But I, I, I yeah, I would well, say that I would say that my only modern sort of tool is having uh, two computer monitors. So I have my Word mm -hmm. file on one, and my yes. file that I'm consulting on the other, and I'm typing away on. So I'm sorry. Yes. Thank you for the 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 trophy i'll look that up thank you well i asked for <laughs> selfish reasons but uh this is a wonderful presentation thank you rebecca okay, thank you thanks so much um rebecca we, chat i we have quite a bit in the, uh a lot of praise for sure and then we have i have one question Rachel, yeah, okay, sorry to take took my question away but i have a follow-up to that and it has to do when you were doing this research when once you started organizing all your thoughts uh whether old school or new school did when did you start like joining information together to say ah and this is a picture that's coming out of it because you know from in my mind i i think of ben ezra i think of Schechter, and i think of cambridge that that's my geniza world everything else is kind of periphery to all of that but for you you have 60 institutions or more and then all these geniza fragments all over the country and the world probably when did this come together for you? Like, ah, oh, now you started connecting the pieces or did it happen slow, more organically? It's, it's happened slowly over time. So I, my way of, 
I kind of realized early and, I, and it was really thanks to the Friedberg Geniza project that I had my sort of epiphany uh, and to all the wonderful scholars working on that. I see Ezra Schwartz here as well, who's done some amazing work on, um, yeah. on, on, on the provenance of, of fragments and matching fragments. Uh, but it was really that that sort of opened my eyes to the idea of world Geniza collections and then got me fascinated with trying to understand how they came about but it was it was this kind of free flow idea that I and, and so I, I did that first article the Gadiza secret um, then discovering the Chester connection led to the next article and it's really only as I've I think what I've probably done is I've looked at uh, key protagonists and as I've looked at them and dug into them then the connections have occurred to me um, and so I think by the time I'd done the article for the uh, Judaica li librarianship on Reginald Q. Enrique, I realized that there was, there was a story that could be connected here that I could tell. And then I started to work towards the book, and, but I did so by, by continuing to produce articles on it because it is so vast and it's hard right. to hold together. I hope that explains it. it I does, wish I could. It does. <laughs> it, it does. It does. Yeah. And my, my, for me, my interest, once I saw your article, or Lucy introduced me to your article, it really was incredible. I mean, kind of this cloak and dagger element to it. <laughs> How did that happen? Um, we have uh, about, it's, all, it's 127 according to all three of my clocks here. And um, so if anybody have any more questions, we'll stay on. Otherwise, um, we get us uh, the, 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 we're going to approaching the one hour mark. Okay. Too. So Rebecca, thank you very, very much. Yeah, this is welcome. your, I have to say, this is the Acharona Charon Chaviv of our books about the talk for this um, uh, AJL calendar year too. And actually we look forward to seeing more stuff coming from you. I am for sure. Thank you. <laughs> it's very it's, it's incredible so research much. too. It's, it's, and it's really in, inspirational. Um, thank you everybody for coming. I appreciate, we appreciate AJL, appreciates all of you taking time from your day, uh, whether it's morning, noon or night. Thank you all. And we have to hope to have uh, more future books about books talks after July 4, I think. Anyways, I wish you all a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.